This is uh, Clifford Brooks. He's the author of The Draw of Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics, as well as the founder of Southern Collective Experience. Great poet, really cool guy. He's on the line with us now. Are you there? Absolutely cool. I am, fellas. Hey, Hey, welcome aboard World Poetry Open, Mike. I'm so glad you were able to to reach out and we're able to connect like we have. Oh, that's a pleasure and an honor. Oh, the honor is all ours, my friend. So we we uh, we just you know I just kind of introduced you uh, about you know the books you've written as as well as uh, Southern Collective Experience. But why don't you give a short kind of bio about you know who you are and what you do, so that people who are listening kind of have a better idea. Well, my name is Clifford Brooks, and I came out with a uh, book called "The Draw of Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics" around four years ago, and it was met with absolutely uh unexpected success and it's nominated for a pulitzer and georgia author of the year and from that it sprung me into the idea of uh with the attention i was getting not doing favors to others but it opened the door for me to create a group that has ultimately come a corporation as far as um folks from all walks of life uh, not just below the Mason-Dixon line, but more with what we call the Dixie spirit. And it's those that are making art their life uh, financially and uh, from the center of themselves. And they're humble. It breaks the stereotypes of which artists have unfortunately earned in many cases that we can't work together, that we are not able to meet deadlines, that um, being able to pay the bills in what we find our most passionate place in this world is actually doable. And over the last five years, we've cultivated it into a fantastic group of uh, young men and women that uh, have broken those rules already in the best way possible. And you're able to find that on www.southerncollectiveexperience.com where you can see how that's branched out into a magazine called The Blue Mountain Review a show on NPR called Dante's Old South that's also shown and broadcast through WYYZ 1490 AM out of my neck of the woods here in North Georgia, and a reading series type festival with music, poetry, and prose readings called the Collective Sessions. All of these things can be found on the site, and I urge anyone who's listening to check it out and submit and support our group and look to be affiliates or being in the magazine or into some way find out how they can beat the odds as we have with seminars that we have and, and will offer to the public in the future. It's been an absolute pleasant shock um, how well it's been received and we're just truly getting started. That's fantastic. And creativity is some of the best work you can do in this life. Uh, people that are artists, no matter what their medium is, and supporting them Amazing. I'm glad that you've dedicated so much of your time and life to doing so. Thank you. Now, I think you did hit on something. We're, we're going to uh, get to your work here in just a second, and, and I think we'll have a little bit more of a discussion about this after that. But yes, sir. the the difference between – there is a difference between being an artist and being an artist who makes a living doing that yes, art. Sir. I mean, yes. and it's it's a big mental shift. It's a big work ethic shift, I think. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, you know, so I, I would definitely recommend people who are listening to this – and are interested in kind of those those topics, definitely go to the site and see what they have to offer it and what they're talking about. That's big That's big stuff. Yes, and we're going to have a link on our site here real shortly after the show. That way they can link through. That's right. Fantastic. Thank you. So uh, as far as your work as a poet, though, this is, this is a show of poets. Yeah. Do you have something you'd like to share with us? I do. I am going to read two poems from... The Draw of Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics, and then I'm going to read a new piece in my upcoming book called Athena Departs. All right. All right. So we'll start with one piece, and I'll uh, lay the stage here to bridge the gap of racial inequality and understanding and compassion. I had I grew up in uh, Oglethorpe County, right below Athens, Georgia, and it was a very culturally diverse uh, community. And I was raised in part by a nanny named Virginia, which I call Jin Jin. And she would take us to the grocery store and she taught me much about, much about the culture and would tell me stories from really the old faith and the old school of thought that she would find in, in many of the stories like Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Bear, uh, written by a gentleman here from Georgia. And 
years later, I moved to North Georgia where I first saw the Klan and the love that she had shown me and the hatred that I had, that I saw in the courthouse steps just kind of juxtaposed into this idea that culminated in my head for quite a while and turned into this poem where it took two parts of my life into one where I envisioned being in a car with her going to a grocery store that you don't find many places anymore called Bell's, which we did on occasion. What if she had been in the car with me so many times being that way in the past and us seeing it together? And so it was kind of an homage to her and a dedication to my love to her and the love that she showed me. So the poem is called, I Saw the Clan Today. Morning, headed to Bell's. Klansmen haunted the courthouse. I was eight. Virginia seethed. Some folks just like to live ugly. Her almond knuckles pale on the steering wheel. Our car sped up. She had wild eyes on those violent phantoms and wedding white faces tight behind a bed sheet. They were chanting. Virginia panted my knee. Don't even look at him, baby. At home, I slept in her lap. She hummed, go tell it on the mountain, praying that I grew into a man who witnessed wrong and became a blade against it. My mahogany mother squeezed me, smoothed my hair, sad at the state of our world. I saw the clan today. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, I got to say, one of the things that captivated me when we first first came in contact with each other, you sent a couple of links to uh, to you performing spoken word art. Such a distinct voice among amongst poets that I was like, "Holy cow, we got to have this guy on the show." If nothing else, as a caller, but definitely as a feature too. Thank you. Uh, actually, from one of those videos, it's one of the one of those that I'm asked to read the most, and is honestly one of my favorite. And it's called "There Are Hours." And again, it takes two ideas from different points in my life, where one is my relationship with my father, which again, the whole world braces because every poet, you know, like Kafka, has had this terrible relationship with their dad. And it's not about that. It's about him trying to save me the sorrow that I was going to find later and an awful uh, romantic relationship that um, was not so much regret, but it's a poem of me looking back and thanking him for what he tried to do. And um, uh, there's a poem in my new book, again, the extension of it, where it's more into it. The first book, uh, I wasn't ready to delve into to, to the deeper connections I had with my parents and, and, and the love for my grandfather and, and those that were very prized and still prized and precious to me that you see a lot more in my second book. And I allude to it here, kind of setting the stage for it. And it's called, There Are Hours. This is havoc, a red splattered cheek, change in sunlight. My stance is aloof, distracted, right foot dragging from watching my father limp with a fake hip. As a child, I picked up his pillbox, his money clip, and that carnal eye. Now he shook me because of my coming broken heart. There is choice than the reality of bloodlines, of reoccurring men, of one wolf giving way to an animal, his brood, but sharper, better, at being feral, a scourge. But Pop's lectures were lost, incinerated on my spirit. He told me what cannot be released will stalk and mangle another life. I hold no roses and lakeside grasses. In my arms, there is no basket of intimacy unfulfilled. No scripture whispers in my twisted ear. So how does a cloistered man with a gaping wound dismiss his bleeding, his gushing? In this labyrinth, I can't find the leading thread out. 
for I am Minos and his gluttonous son. A lady gives me a volley of crushing anchors. Love is splint spindled only in one artery. Through churning valves, I allow a single set of platelets. This is a leak of what was, but never was, us. It seems that stone is the softest aorta. I cannot go on eclipsed. I am more than that silver peaking. I'm the soothing ring behind what's lonely only because of stabbing fate. Right now, my pretty girl drives fast out of state. Enter, melancholy cinders. I eat fists of pomegranate for more time in Hades. Quiet in the bowels beneath this constant barrage. Languishing there among shades, forgetting I will be no one. The trees, the plantation songs, those goddamn morning glories flutter above me like looting butterflies whose wings move so loudly. Better sense screams in vain. In vain, those angels exhausted point away from sticks, begging, knowing I still hear them. Sing aloud, Salve Regina, I am me. I am now content to be marked a libertine, welcoming another messy orgasm as a man, now a swan, to experience virgins. New breasts avert the vision of one girl. Please, Lord, run me from her. In a wheelbarrow, carry my clattering bones to Lexington's empty church house. There are hours. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. And the last that I'll read here is called In the Beginning There Were Two Calloused Hearts. And this one was from a brief encounter with a young lady with ill intent who thought more of herself, and I mean this in no derogatory stabbing way because I believe in, in writing to attack someone that cannot answer and to attack someone in writing is such a petty trite thing that it really demeans your point, which is it was an experience you grew from it. But at the same time coming to terms with and admitting through creative form that maybe it shouldn't have ended that way that she chose. In the beginning, there were two calloused hearts. Early dawn brought distraction, labor, a lack of luster pharmaceutical companies adore. Last night, I saw black dogs, heard the desperate gasps of a panicked child, and struck dumb the boisterous voice. At noon, you said, Get over here and drive me. So I spent hours with you, lost, boozy, knowing you were thinking of someone else. We sped in a thoroughbred until tears were chased behind the moon. Gordon, calmest of man's best friends, took us to the river by a path of wildflowers hidden behind a low stone wall. We sat near a spot turtles stopped to sun. You said, do you need your little notebook? No, no, I don't. The supper we shared was served by a Lebanese man sporting bad teeth and good Mexican food. Our new evening got topped off with tequila and kisses. You said, I like you too much. I don't need to feel this affectionate blood. Remember that there are others. <laughs> That's fine, dark-haired, frightened one. You see, my days are a malady where I am thrown asunder in time. I do not know the day 
I am not aware of tomorrow's appointments. In the face of all evenings kin to our memory, I am cognizant of only this encounter, this football game, the breath before I leave. So remember how I said before, as I do now, I have grown beyond wanting anything from you. In the beginning, there were two calloused hearts. Thank you, guys. Thank Very you. well done. Um, the takeaway from that is definitely, and I've said this time and again on our show, live in the now for this experience in this moment. Well, that's really something, man. Um, okay, so just looking at the time and this is something we talked about doing, we wanted to do uh, for the poets who are in the you know on the on the air and on the show listening now. A few times in the past, we've done a short kind of discussion about a topic. Okay, and we're going to be doing the return engagement after this, so stay tuned for that. But we just wanted to do something briefly, uh, and and you know, Clifford talked to you as well about um, you know the topic of continually pounding on your craft, getting stronger as a, as a writer or as a musician or as a composer or a filmmaker, whatever, whatever you're whatever, doing. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of just start the conversation with all of us here. Um, as all of us are artists, you know, we all work on our craft, I'm sure, but it's something that can eventually kind of take a back seat when you're just kind of writing all the time. You know, it, right. it's hard to really start focusing on it. So how do you approach, uh, let's start with you, actually. How do you, how do you approach growing as an artist? Uh, you know, especially with, you know, being nominated for a, for a Pulitzer and, and all of that, I'm sure it's, it's very easy to kind of just fall into whatever I write's gold, you know, that, that kind of moment. So how do you go about that? Well, first of all, and not to be Southern cliche, but my mama raised me better than to be too vain. And my, <laughs> all right. Yeah. And my father is from a long line of successful businessmen that said, son, the moment you get comfortable, you lose it all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, vanity is the bane of our existence. And so many, I read the side note for PBS, my agent got a hold of me and said, uh, they want you to read a poem that you find one of your favorites. I'm a fan of Bukowski's early work, not so much of his latter work, because I love Hunter S. Thompson too, but they both kind of became cartoons in the end. With all that aside, he wrote a poem, Bukowski, called On Poetry Readings, and that immediately came to mind. And it's like, you know, poetry readings are the saddest damn things ever. And I'm a poet and I love it, but it's that it's the, it, it, that that's the malaise you fall into with so many reading groups. And i and that plays directly into my answer is that it's, they've become, and I know why people avert going because it's either someone screaming at you to hide the fact that they're horrible at their craft when really all it does is personify the fact that they're terrible. And now you want to punch them in the throat, but <laughs> yeah. And they always want to stomp out and leave in this very dramatic emotional, and I'll snatch him by the throat and be like, no, you sit your ass right down. You're going to listen to the rest of us, too. Um, <laughs> but uh, all jokes aside, it, it's, it's, you don't get better. One, I challenge myself because to an extent, not to an extent, what I do is so that I don't have people reading from the first book or the second book going, I've seen this. I wrote uh, The Draw Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics. It's two books in one with, uh, with an epic at the end called The Gateman of Ignoration. Gateman's hymn of Ignoration. It's the uh, huge fan of Dante. And so I conjured in my mind, working so long in social work, that there's got to be a place worse than hell for child molesters, those who hurt women, those who exploit people through money in the courts or uh, sure. through church. Yeah. And so with a book that thick, it, it allows, and a lot of poets, I think, make the mistake of having very short books putting all the money into the hardback cover and, and people are not going to spend that kind of money, not because I'm putting down poetry, but you can spend that kind of money on two novels and go on a journey for months. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. So in, in writing a longer book, it gives you the chance to live more life so that you're not going back to those same instances in a short moment of time, because people have read that they've known that they want to hear what you're growing into. And that's the, the mantra that I cleave to that is it's, who am I now? What am I doing now? I wrote a, uh, an article called Say It or Don't Say It for Writer's Digest on how I edit poetry. And I'm a, uh, for those, and I mean no disrespect, when someone says, you know, I, I, the, the, the muse moved me, so I just threw it down the paper and it was done. I, editing is just like with prose. It's vital. 
you want to cut it to the marrow, but not so deep that you're left with a skeleton. Right. And from that, I springboard into the collective again, where you have people who aren't these snarky, petty, selfish, vile humans who are there to put you down out of jealousy, but those who do love you will give you valuable criticism and, and keep you on fleek and they keep you on edge and they, and they challenge you in a very productive way. And so you need that. You need that inner, that bit, truly, and again, a lot of artists hate to hear this, but the business sense, I'm not going to go so far as to say that you need to sit down at the same time every day and do that, but you need to make it an effort every time to treat it like a job. Job is not a bad word. When you love what you do, it's never really work, yep. you know, yep. not in the sense that Americans see it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's really due diligence on our part, but then surrounding yourself with people who go, dude, that's kind of lazy. And again, you know, it's like to read the poetry where maybe it's about something very sensitive and they can see where you're getting a little chicken to write it out and call you out on it in a, in a very productive way while also keeping you humble, but boosting you when you need it. I think and that's so big. Those, yeah. those, 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 really those components together and then the avid reading of poetry. Now that the snag there could be, and I'm very cautious of this because I'm, I'm always very aware that I don't inadvertently use something that I've just read and put into my own poetry but you have to read, I believe, and take a break. I've always taken a step back. I'll, like Athena Departs, I wrote, and then I really took about a year off and just take a step back to come back and see it anew through my editors and when they brought it back to me, and it's made all the difference. There's a systematic... Now, again, it's not the same for everybody, just like in any other vocation. But for me, these integral parts have made me the poet and, and really the man and someone who can stand as the, the, the CEO and the president of the collective not as look at me, but as someone that if you're going to do it, do it. Don't talk about it. Live it. And people will see that or they'll disconnect in that fake mask that so many wear and want to, to play the faux poet. So you know, that's how I stay on it. That, that's a real thing because I think there's there's something that we can, uh, you know, as as creative people. And I've fallen into this, you know, doing things for a living, too, where it's like you need to produce something to be right. able to make money. And so it's easy to think, okay, market, let's let's hit something the market's going to want. Let's let's do something that's in a way it's easy. But there's a totally different mindset between just going after that and then also going after that and saying, how do I write something or how do I create something or how do I do something that will exist after I die that will still matter, you know? And exactly. and, and to really do that work and it takes you it's very rare that someone's just going to vomit that on the page. You know, you right. got to drill. You got to work. And right. It, yeah. Um. So basically, it's about execution and not ideas. It's yes, what sir. what you manifest into reality with your creations. Exactly, because we all have ideas. We all have moments. We all are going to do something. We're fixing to do something. The gerunds they bother me. What are you doing now? You know, Excuse how me. are you doing it now? How are you engaging it now? Everybody. You know, Faulkner said one of my favorite quotes. He said. There are two types of writers in the world. There are those that do, and there are those that talk about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's a reason why people like James Joyce had to leave Dublin before writing his book, because he knew if he stayed there, he just would have talked about it until it went away. He had yes. to leave to write. His environment, and that's absolutely true. I mean, so much of my work is about the journey, the travel, because you get to incorporate in where you're from and enrich people on the, the background, but then in that journey the things that you're learning along the way. And it can be uh, one drive to the beach or it can be completely metaphorical where it's a, kind of, a, again, like a Dante-esque or a, a split you know, path in the woods by Frost where it's completely metaphorical, um, an allegory for how you have taken a personal journey from point A to point B. I have found that that is really more telling about yourself. You, especially in that case, have a longer poem, which you have more of a challenge to make tight, um, I found more use in internal rhyme. I don't believe, I, not that I don't believe in free verse, but it, it, it's, it, I have struggled for a long time to figure out how I describe how I write poetry. And it's more the way musicians compose music than the way people conceive of how poetry is written and having the rhyme inside. The longer the piece, the tighter it has to be with the internal rhyme pulling the reader along and hearing that music that you're creating. Because songs and poetry are the same thing. The, po the poems are just missing the chorus. So it's up to us to create that music and that soundtrack along the way 
to open yourself up on every level to communicate with somebody. You have you, once you start saying, "All right, how do I write this to sell it?" You are dead in the water. I agree because I agree. you're writing vanilla bullshit. Yes, and, yes, that's it, man. And, and that's so, it. So I mean, again, it's it's got to be you, and it, it goes into trademarking you, and you can't do the pomp and circumstance or play the rock star poet or the too cool poet or the drunk poet. You be you. And it, you know, it sounds like I'm preaching, and I'm truly not, because on the other hand, lies are a job. And say you do get in there, and, you're, and your book is like all the little pieces. Isn't that what it's called? The book, the guy that went on Oprah, and he got totally busted for just Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he came back on. She invited him and said, oh, I won't go ahead. And then just gutted him, which she should have, because there's poetic license and prose and poetry. But then there's just outright lies. Right. And the public sees that. Mm-hmm. It's being genuine. Branding yourself and being you honestly is easy because it's you you just wake up and keep doing what you're doing and if people lock onto that and cleave to that and see that honesty and that integrity they're starved for it in that and that's why so many have disconnected from the art world in general and it's, it's a void that we need to fill yes i when i owned the title poet back in 2008 i decided at that moment that I was going to be 100% genuine. You see people all over the internet. Oh, I'm a level five black belt. I got a power boat, whatever. Right. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to be me. And if people like me, great. If not, fine too. Whatever. Fuck them. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. We, we'll let that no, one slide. Yeah, we got it. We got it. <laughs> now, hey, so uh, we, we're going to move into the uh, the next segment here, uh, Clifford. But it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Yeah, I was going to say, are you, do you want to come back and do this at a later point this year too? I would absolutely love that, gentlemen. That'd be, and I'm sorry if I hogged all the time. Oh, no, no that was no, great. No, you're doing fine. We all loved right. hearing it. So, everybody, check out. Uh, it is the um, – the or Southern, Southern Collective Experience yes. dot com, and uh, really check it out. Some really valuable stuff on there, and uh, we'll uh, we'll hopefully have him back. Let us know if you like that in the chat room. If you liked the conversation and, and hearing his work, I know we loved it here. Yes, astounding. Thank you, Clifford, and we will talk to you again real soon. Gentlemen, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. That was Clifford Brooks on World Poetry Open Mic, the next evolution of Poetry Radio.